On the evening of April 14, 2016, around 9 p.m., a 20-year-old police officer by the name of Matthew Boynton was spending the evening with his wife of six months, 19-year-old Jessica Boynton, and their two sons, 8-month-old Tyler and 2-year-old Tallinn. Matthew and Jessica began arguing, yelling loud enough that the neighbors could hear. Matthew quickly called the police on Jessica, claiming that she was screaming and yelling and being slightly physical, poking him in the chest while she screamed. Instead of waiting for an officer to arrive, Jessica then headed over to a neighbor's house to spend some time, hoping that the separation would be long enough for them both to calm down. Around 10 p.m., Matthew sends Jessica a text stating that they need to go to Walmart together to get some baby formula. Jessica then meets Matthew by the family truck and heads to Walmart. Walmart security footage captures the family entering Walmart around 10.15 p.m. Roughly 30 minutes later, security footage then catches Jessica again, this time storming at a Walmart alone. Matthew again calls another officer, this time stating that Jessica is refusing to leave the store with him. Moments later, security footage displays Matthew, Jessica, and the kids getting into the family truck and leaving Walmart together. After arriving home around 11 p.m., neighbors believe that they hear screaming and yelling again, and sometime between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m., one neighbor also believes they hear a gunshot. This neighbor takes a look out his window and sees Matthew walking towards his truck, appearing as though everything was okay. It turns out Matthew was actually leaving the house around midnight to go and meet up with another officer, Officer Joshua Guthrie, for a late night meal at a Waffle House. As Matthew pulled into the Waffle House parking lot, he receives a single text from Jessica. I can't do this anymore. Take care of Tallinn and Tyler. Please tell them I love them every day. I have been suffering for a while now and no one has noticed. Here lately, I have not been able to recognize the person that I see in the mirror. This is not the first time that I have had suicide thoughts. I love you and the boys. Matthew then immediately calls a friend at police dispatch. Are you on EMS? Mm-hmm. Can you please dispatch a unit out to my uh, location? Give me a reference uh, to my wife. Um, I left the location. I'm, I'm back in around on Carver Road now. I'll be back there in about two minutes. Uh, she's having suicidal thoughts. My kids are at home with her. So I'm trying to hurry up and get back there. I'm driving. She just said that she's been experiencing suicidal thoughts right now. She told me to take care of the boys. So I'm trying to hurry up and get back home just to make sure that nothing's going to happen to them. Any weapons inside the house? Um, just my service weapon. Matthew makes it back to the apartment before help arrives and hears baby Tyler crying. Matthew then enters the home and heads towards the closet where he keeps his service revolver. The door is locked from the inside. Matthew, now frantic, then makes another call. I believe I just heard a shot fired coming in my residence. I just came up the stairs two rounds to be a positive a smoke gun smoke, and I can't get an answer to the door. Stay outside. 10-4. Matthew Boynton then claims that due to fear, he left the apartment immediately after that call and waited for more officers to arrive before re-entering. The officers then arrive on the scene, and Matthew Boynton is waiting by the door. Stay out, Matt. Stay out, stay out. Is this the master? Where's the master room, Matt? Right? Keep an eye on that way. It's crayon. Hey, open this. The police officers quickly enter and begin to search Matthew Boynton's apartment. They see both of the sons, Tyler and Tallinn, are unharmed. They then access the locked bedroom closet by force kicking the door open. Inside, they find Jessica Boynton, who appears to have suffered a bullet wound to the head, laying on the floor with her head on top of a blood-soaked pillow. Matthew's service weapon was lying directly underneath her. Do you know what she used? A uh, Glock 40. 40 caliber. One of Jessica and Matthew's neighbors, who had actually spent a couple hours with Jessica earlier that day, notices the lights from her apartment and runs over to the police officer standing outside. The neighbor asked, It's Jessica, isn't it? The police replied, Yes. The neighbor then asked, Is she still alive? And the police replied, Yes. As it turns out, Jessica was actually very much alive at the time of her discovery. However, she was in critical condition. 
The paramedics quickly arrange for her to be airlifted to the Atlanta Trauma Center. Just minutes after Jessica is airlifted, Sheriff Wendell Beam asks deputies to deliver the devastating news to Jessica's family that she's dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. While at the trauma center, the doctors working to help save Jessica shave her head to locate the potential gunshot wounds. They find zero gunshot wounds. However, they did find what appears to be a major injury caused by blunt force trauma to the top of her head. After spending approximately three weeks in a coma, Jessica Boynton begins to regain consciousness. Though she was once declared dead, she is now very much alive and able to answer questions. Unfortunately, she is unable to remember anything that had happened from the night of the incident. After making a full recovery, the doctor stated that there was zero evidence that Jessica was depressed or suicidal. Regardless, due to the night at question, Jessica was served with a family protection order, which gave Matthew full custody of the children and restricted Jessica from going anywhere near them. Matthew Boynton was cleared of any involvement in the incident labeled as the attempted suicide of Jessica Boynton. Many of you may be noticing that many of the occurrences in this case appear to be potentially manufactured to protect Matthew Boynton from any responsibility. And to take this further, much of the information that I'm about to present may lead to further speculation of conspiracy. However, it is important to remember that Matthew Boynton has already been officially cleared of any wrongdoing in this case. Let's now take a look at the finer details. Matthew and Jessica had been together since high school, since Jessica was 15 and Matthew was 16. At around 17 to 18 years old, the couple eventually went on to have a child together, and despite being fairly young, they decided to raise the baby themselves. Matthew always wanted to become a police officer, as it was a career that ran in his family, and his grandfather, Wendell Beam, was still the sheriff. He eventually graduated high school and made his dreams of becoming a police officer come true. Once work became his passion, Matthew quickly became more strict and more controlling, often taking the truck keys with him to work as a way to restrict Jessica from using the truck when he wasn't around. As the relationship between Matthew and Jessica progressed, approximately one year after having their first son, Jessica began having an affair and became pregnant once again, but this time with another man's baby. Despite the affair causing turmoil between the two, Matthew and Jessica decided to stay together and attempt to raise the second child as their own. They then got married around November of 2015, about six months before the incident. Very quickly after the marriage, Jessica then discovers that Matthew has begun cheating on her as well, with a new girlfriend by the name of Courtney Calloway. Jessica quickly began keeping a journal documenting every time that Matthew would be spending time with Courtney. During March and April of 2016, Jessica lost her patience with the entire situation and began secretly packing belongings so that she and the kids could leave Matthew in a hurry if she made the decision to. There is speculation that Matthew Boynton may have caught on to Jessica's awareness of his new girlfriend and Jessica's subsequent plans to divorce him. It is possible that he felt that there may have been enough evidence against him to grant her primary custody of their children due to his recent infidelity. After calling the police and reporting Jessica for screaming and poking him aggressively in the chest, Jessica heads over to the neighbors. Matthew then texts Jessica about picking up baby formula and heading to Walmart together. At Walmart, Matthew Boynton can be seen wearing this outfit. They then leave Walmart around 10.45 p.m. and arrive home around 11 p.m. Sometime between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m., one of the Boynton's neighbors hear a single gunshot. Matthew is then witnessed leaving their home and heading to his late night meal with Officer Guthrie. He receives the distressing text from Jessica. Instead of calling dispatch right away, he first replies to his girlfriend Courtney. He then calls dispatch and races home. He arrives at home and apparently hears the two gunshots. Before he calls dispatch again, he sends his girlfriend Courtney another text message. He then calls dispatch again. I believe I just heard a shot fired coming in my residence. I just came up the stairs two rounds to be a positive a smoke gun smoke, and I can't get an answer to the door. Stay outside. Ten four. When the police arrive on the scene, they find a frantic Matthew Boynton, now acting extremely emotional and in a completely different composure as compared to the messages that he sent to Courtney just moments earlier. 
Also, something interesting to note. Matthew is now wearing a completely different outfit to the one that he had on not much earlier while he was at Walmart. After the police arrived to the scene and likely recognized the amount of potential red flags, she used his gun. She used his gun. His police gun. Hey, can I get home? Matthew Boynton was not treated as a potential suspect in this case which some have speculated is likely due to his grandfather, Sheriff Wendell Beam, being in control at the time. Although Matthew was acting seriously emotionally distraught in several moments from the body cam footage. I mean, if, if I could have been here two minutes earlier, man, I could have jumped in front of the gun and tried to get it from her, man. Matthew is actually back to work within two weeks of this incident. Many of the neighbors made statements regarding the night at question. The same neighbor that questioned the police about whether Jessica was still alive on the night of the shooting made many further statements claiming that she had been with Jessica just hours beforehand and says her friend would have never tried to take her own life. Many neighbors claimed to have heard a single gunshot, but never at the time that Matthew claimed it happened. Instead, they claimed it happened between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m., before Matthew left for his late night meal with Officer Guthrie. Family and friends also claimed that Jessica hated guns and would not understand how to handle one. The police had also located the journal that Jess had kept to document when Matthew had been cheating. It was discovered next to her body on the night of the shooting, with several pages torn out. The medical professionals that saved Jessica claimed that she did not suffer any gunshot injuries. Instead, it was more likely that she was struck by an object at the top of her head, causing her to suffer major blunt force trauma injuries. There was no blood spatter found in the closet where Jessica is presumed to have shot herself. And the list goes on. Despite all of this, the department was confident about their determination that this was a suicide attempt since they found Jessica's DNA on Matthew's service weapon. However, they did not find any gunshot residue on Jessica's hands. Matthew's hands were also not tested for gunshot residue. Within a few months following Jessica's full recovery, Jessica Boynton went on to file a report that Matt was not returning all of her items, including some clothing and a retainer. Matt would go on to constantly deny that he had any other items of Jessica's. A private investigator by the name of Will Sanders eventually took interest in this case, and at one point, Matthew's new girlfriend located a bag that she believed may have contained all of Jessica's belongings. She then provided Will Sanders with this bag, and Will brought the bag to the police. Despite Matthew being cleared on all charges regarding the night of the shooting, seven months later, Matthew was then brought in to be interrogated for interfering in a police investigation. Conducting an, an internal investigation on you, okay? okay? So Garrity is not implied. Okay. okay, I want you to understand that, all right? Okay. All right, Garrity is not implied to this incident, okay? Can you fully explain what that? I understand part of it, just. She's gonna read, she's gonna read you Miranda. Okay. So I just wanna let you know that we're not, I'm not conducting, I know I do IAs, but this yeah. is not an IA, this is a reference to a criminal investigation, okay? Okay. What's that in reference to? It's in reference to, you remember the um, statement you wrote me about Jessica saying you took items from the house? Yeah, that computer, yeah. That's what it's going to be in reference to. Okay. So Jessica came in, she filed a report. Um, okay. I talked to you about it. Uh, you wrote a statement saying you didn't have any of her items. Um, right. The report specifically said her retainer and stuff like that and clothes. Okay. Um, do you know anything about where her clothes or retainer might have been? Like I told her before, the only thing that we might have had would have been in that white trailer, and my stepdad has not mentioned anything else being in there. And we gave everything back that we had, because she had put some stuff in like a, uh, it's like a little foot chase thing. Mm -hmm. We opened up, it's got two little boxes. I think we used to use it for like diapers and stuff now, but I mean, everything that she had that I knew of was gone. I got rid of everything I knew of. You got rid of a house, so. To get, either give back to her or her family came back and got it. You know, like she had a big kitchen table and some other stuff that her Aunt Kathy and Uncle Tim had come and got. Um, just different. I think my stepdad actually took a whole bunch of stuff over to her grandparents' house at 2460 East Milner mm -hmm. in Pike. 
which is like right by my parents' house. So, you recognize that bag? Yeah, it's that bag that Jessica let me use to put all my gym stuff in when we used to be together. Okay. So, when's the last time you saw that bag? Uh, it's been a long time. <coughs> like I said, I, when I used to work out at, um, there's two gyms in Thomaston. I don't remember the name of it. I used that one, and I had a uh, green Nike bag I used to work out in. Um, so, I interchanged my stuff like protein drinks, um, powder shakes like pre-workout, uh, workout shorts, pants, shoes, whatever. I'd put it in that bag or my Nike bag. So, when's the last time you saw that bag? I mean, it's been a while. I don't, I don't know the exact date. I don't know. Um, I think my stepdad, he he had it in the, I think the white trailer, and that that's been a while. And he brought it, but I haven't been through it or anything. Um, he put it in my storage, put it in my storage thing in my house, which is like when you pull in the driveway. Mm -hmm. It's a little storage thing on the right. You open the door and it's got all my stuff in there. I had to clean that some of it out recently. That was tossed in there, but I mean, it's in there with a bunch of my stuff, like a brown tub I used to keep in my old patrol car with gym mm -hmm. stuff in it and work stuff. Would so, that be the utility room or carport room at your new house? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I keep, like, or I, well, I keep stuff in that, and I keep stuff in, like, what's considered an office and left the back of my house. Mm -hmm. so, I just tossed it in the rest of my gym. <clears throat> that's just old gym bag. you a long time. Yes, sir. This bag, you saw it moving when you moved from your apartment to the main road. I didn't know. And, and, and your stepdad, and Wendell. Wendell saw it. And another female saw it. All right? Okay. At the house, in the apartments, just for nothing. When you um, moved from the park. When I when I moved, like I said, I had all my stuff in the white trailer. Man, that's, that's not that's not what I'm asking you. When y'all were in the process of moving, and you moved into the house that you're at now, your residence, did you did you not see this bag? Yes, sir. It was in my storage room in the in the garage. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, why would I be holding a picture of this bag? Well, I guess because Jessica brought it into you. Why would Jessica have it if you had it at your house? Um, I don't know. I guess somebody got it from my garage or <clears> my shed. Who would have got that? Um, there's a couple of people. Okay. I don't know. All right. Exactly who. Okay. And bag. inside that bag, there were numerous contents inside of it. And one of those is this right here. You know what this is? It's like Jessica's old retainer thing. Mm -hmm. She had them wear together. Right. The bag was completely filled with female clothes. And this is one photo of it. That's not yours. No. No. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. That's not yours. No, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Who does that belong to? This guy, Jessica's name, wants to be Jessica's retainer thing. <sighs> If it was in that, if it was in this right here, where would that have been at? I had all her stuff in it. In my, what would it have been at? It would have been in my the garage thing, like I said. In. Which is where? Which is at my house. Which is at your house. Yes, sir. Did you buy that for Jessica? I don't recall. I don't think I did. Because she had. I think her grandparents did. Because she had retainers before she met you, right? Before y'all got married, right? I believe so. So that would make it whose property? Uh, hers. Not yours, right? Right. Yes, sir. Whose bag is that? Uh, Jessica's. And the contents in the bag? It's got all her stuff in it. 
So why would you not have brought that to us when you noticed, when you saw the bag at moving? Sarge, I promise I've not been through that bag. The last time I used Matthew, that bag I was for this. I didn't ask you that, Matthew. Listen to me, buddy. I, the, 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 I understand what you're saying, Miss Jessica. I'm not sure I brought it up here. You know, Next all time. things, and I don't know anything about your other issue, but all things involved in reference to this case, all the going around, the statement that you wrote, Where's the statement at? The statement that you wrote. You said statement. I didn't read this. I don't know what the statement said. What did it say? Uh, it's just very brief. I uh, gave Jessica a property like I gave her a computer and everything. Right. Yes, sir. Whose is this bag? It's Jessica's. I just I didn't think, think about it because I used it as a gym bag and she let me use it. I understand what you're saying. Matthew, a police officer. Yes, sir. I understand. You're a police officer, Matthew. You know we are held to a higher standard than anybody else. I understand. You know people don't 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 expect us to make mistakes and they don't realize we're human. I understand that. Yes, you sir. understand that. I should have been smarter about it. was turned into us. We have possession of the bag. Yes, sir. We have evidence <coughs> that says it came out of your storage room. Is that true? Yes, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say? No, sir. I said I was just done with one part of the do you believe? Do you believe that statement to be accurate and true? Not now. Did you believe it then? No, sir. Sorry, man. I had to smoke a cigarette. You're good. Uh, man, man, I, I, I'm walking around outside. Why would you say you didn't have the damn bag when you had it? You know you can't give a sworn statement and lie on it. I know, Sarge. Why would you do that, Matthew? I don't know. It was a bag, man. It wasn't. It's not like it was. Talk to me, man. I mean, help me understand. I'm sorry, I swear to God, I know it's, I know it's hard to believe, but I didn't think about that bag. Otherwise, I wouldn't have wrote, I wouldn't have wrote, I said, hold on, LT. I got something, let me go get it. I swear, I wouldn't have done that. Because I've got two kids, three and one. I wouldn't jeopardize that over a bag. If, I'm telling you, sorry. If I would have thought about it then, I would have said something. But you knew you had I the bag. And I, Did you not I know said, you had the bag? I'm sorry, I, my mind's right. I don't It was the right thing to do, man. I'm clear. What do you think should happen now? I know that's probably going to happen. No, that's not what I asked you. So, what do you think should happen?
kids and daddy's boys, man. <laughs> if I would have thought about it, I would have done it. Of all, of all the stuff that you, you see about you, you know if you were in possession of something that belonged to her, you know you should have, you could have brought it to me. You know I'm going to do the right thing, you know I have to do the right thing. I would have took care of it, I would have gotten the bag back to her. But when you knew you had the bag and you didn't do anything about it, man, you put me in a situation where I got I don't have any other choice. I'm clear. I'm clear. There's no excuse for it. Here. I know it's got that on there. I mean, I, I it's, just, it's so hard, like well, I, I love working here. I know you, know, you do. And I, I was asked you, I, mean, I was so scared to come to work every day. Why? Because every time I did. You know, it was always uh, eleven seventy nine or ten twenty two to forty two. Come up here, I and mean, it's always something. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I thought if I brought it up here, I was going to get fired and whatever. I mean, I don't know. I'm but, so young. And stupid. But Matthew, you know, doing the right thing, regardless, it doesn't matter. If you do the right thing, you can live with yourself. Nine times out of ten, I, I do. I don't, I mean, that's the way I was raised. But you, you know that. You know that you have to do the right thing. And when you found, even if, if you found the bag, you should have said, hey, hey, LT, hey, Sar, hey, whoever. I got something, man. Stop for a minute and talk to me. I don't know what I was thinking then. I don't know if it's because I was scared. I mean, I, I, come, I told you, I come to work every day scared. Now. There's no excuse. I'm not trying to make one for myself. I know I'm obviously not employed anymore. It's just like, the only thing I can think about now is my kids, man. My, my kids. I'm daddy's boys. Matthew Boynton quickly made the decision to resign from the Griffin Police Department before he could be fired and was charged with one felony count of making false statements and writings as well as one felony count of violation of oath of office. Matthew is no longer able to work as a police officer in the city of Griffin, but is still free to work as a police officer in the state of Georgia. After several evaluations, Jessica was able to visit with her kids again. On one visit, one of the sons appeared upset and told Jessica how Matthew had hurt him. Jessica immediately reported this incident. Several evaluations took place and Jessica regained primary custody of both of her sons. Matthew Boynton has challenged this ruling. Matthew's grandfather, Sheriff Wendell Beam, was eventually voted out of office due to several different accusations regarding police corruption and the mishandling of investigations. When the new sheriff moved in, he found nine bags of shredded paper left behind. Why are you so interested in this issue? I, I just don't like people lying to me.